Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's chat is about the Jeep CJ. This long-running vehicle traces its roots prior to the U.S. entering World War II, and ancestors of it exist even through today. So let's take a look at the Jeep CJ and follow some highlights of them over several decades. As always, facts, opinion, and speculation will be given. Consider leaving a like if you enjoyed it, and comments are always welcome. Now let's get off-road. Sir, let me see your war face. Sir, you got a war face? Ah, that's a war face. Now let me see your war face. Ah! What would become the original Jeep was a result of the U.S. military seeking a contract for a vehicle to meet certain specifications. By the late 30s, Germany was really ramping up its war production, as by 1939, World War II had started. The U.S. military didn't want to get caught with their pants down, so to speak, so bids started being offered to construct new classes of vehicles for them. In 1940, the Dodge WC 4x4 series half-ton trucks were being delivered to the military, but they also felt a lighter quarter-ton class of military-grade transportation would be needed too, especially since Germany was already producing a light vehicle, the Kubelwagen which we had a civilian ancestor of it available many years later called the VW Thing. These were light, cheap to crank out, and based off Type 1 Beetle architecture. I already have a Thing chatter if you're interested. Anyway, a car company called American Bantam was working on such a vehicle to fill the need and won the bid over other civilian car makers that were working on a similar Model 2, including Willys Overland and Ford. It was called a Bantam BRC or Bantam Reconnaissance Car, and later in 1940, the first one was presented to the military. Unfortunately for Bantam, they were not a large enough player to meet production requirements. Willys Overland and Ford were granted access to the vehicle in a new contract, and what ultimately came from it would be the Willys MBs, MAs, and Ford GPW, as they could handle large orders. The Willys two variations was dependent on U.S. Military One or Allied Forces model. There was also some contributions by both Willys and Ford engineers that were in the final designs. Examples would be the government like Ford's front-end design from their rejected proposal, and the Willys Go Devil 60-horse engine tested best of the three. These standardized vehicles from different factories came to be known best as Jeeps later and the origin of the name is a bit of a mystery behind it. Some say the Eugene the Jeep character from Popeye comic strips was where it came from. The word at that time was also military slang for a new recruit or vehicle, which would certainly have applied then. Others claim GP or general purpose morphed into the name Jeep, as that was basically the name of the Ford built ones but most folks then were not familiar with that designation. The name Jeep stuck during a publicity stunt done by a Willys test driver in 1941. He drove up the steps of the U.S. Capitol, and when asked what it was, his response was, it's a Jeep. I wouldn't think a Willys guy would have used the name for Ford-built ones, so I'm thinking the GP origin story is incredible. Anyway, Bantam built only 2,675 Jeeps through 1943 and were contracted to produce Jeep trailers during World War II. Willys Overland initially won the bid to produce the Jeeps in 1941, but later the same year, after it was noted they were having trouble filling the order tallies, Ford was contracted to manufacture them too. They were all built to the same specs as the military insisted on 100% interchangeability of parts. You don't want to be on the battlefield with a problem and find out the spare on hand was for a Willys one and you were driving a Ford. An event in December 1941 in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, officially got the U.S. into World War II, but by then the Jeep was ready to aid in the war effort. These were light vehicles with four-wheel drive, unlike the German Kubelwagens. Uh, the Jeeps weighed in about 2,300 pounds. Front and rear suspension had leaf springs, and the engine was a 134 cubic inch or 2.3 liter Go Devil engine designed by Willys Overland and it was rated at 60 gross horsepower. They had a 3-speed manual and 2-speed transfer case. These capable and durable vehicles during the war grew quite the reputation, and the military would continue to use them for many decades to come, 
and not just the U.S. military. During World War II, Willys Overland built about 363,000 Jeeps, and Ford's tally was about 280K. World War II was coming to a close. Willys Overland decided to start producing civilian versions of the Jeep. In 1943, they even trademarked the Jeep name itself, and an advertising claimed that they created the vehicle. Ford and Bantam objected, as they were part of the whole program, especially Bantam. The Federal Trade Commission ruled later in the 1940s that Bantam was the originator, and Willys Overland could not claim that it was their baby. Anyway, Willie was to call them a CJ, or civilian Jeep, they were similar to the military ones, besides adding things like a tailgate, power takeoff, and more. But there was numerous items that were changed, and I'm sure there's sites on YouTube offering a Doug DeMero levels of what they were. CJ-1 and CJ-2 prototypes were created in 1944 and 1945. The first production ones for sale were designated as a CJ-2A starting in 1945. They were initially targeting farmers, ranchers, and commercial buyers. So buying a base one then was really a stripped down vehicle. It only had a driver's seat and single rear tail light as examples. But you could add enough seats for four, winches, canvas tops, heavy duty springs, vacuum powered wipers versus manual ones, and more on the options checklist. The list price for one in 1945 started at $1,090 or about 19,000 in 2024. As they were largely targeting farmers, the colors available were created in shades other farm equipment at the time tended to come in. Pasture green and harvest tan to start. By 1946, you could get one in black, yellow, red, and blue too. CJ2A models were made through 1949 and close to 215,000 were sold. Its successor was the CJ3A, these still had the Go Devil four cylinder engines and three speed manual. Dana transfer cases and axles, which were phased in on the earlier ones once Willys used up their stock of World War II era MB models, was standard now. The suspension was beefed up to better handle agricultural needs and PTO accessories, as that was still the bulk of their buyers. On the civilian side, at least. A 1950 model started at $1,270 or $16,600 today. Close to 132,000 CJs were sold from 1949 to 1953. Now the CJ3B was next arriving for 1953. Willys Overland was acquired by Kaiser and were now referred to as Willys Jeeps versus Willys Overland ones. The most noticeable change with these was the grille and hood were taller to accommodate a new 2.2 liter Willys Hurricane engine that provided up to 75 gross horsepower. In 1963, a four-speed manual was an option. Price for one in 1953 was up to 1,377 bucks or 16,200 now. A similar version of these was called an M606 and it was built for the Mutual Defense Assistance Program. This was an anti-communist government program that provided military vehicles for allied nations throughout the world. This government undertaking lasted until 1967. CJ-3Bs were also licensed to be built by other international car makers. Turkey built some, as did Mitsubishi. The Japanese company actually made a variant of these until 1998. India's Mahendra really went the distance, making their interpretation of a CJ-3B until 2010. As for the U.S. civilian ones, a little over 155,000 of them were made from 1953 to 1968. Now I need to backtrack a few years as there was two CJ models that debuted a year after the CJ-3B in 1954 as 55 models. The latest CJs was intended to replace it originally, but obviously that didn't happen. The first one was called a Willie CJ-5. There was a CJ-4, and I mean that literally, as only one was made. It was a prototype that was made in the early 50s. The new CJ-5 was a large update for the CJs and influenced by the Korean War variant of the Jeep called an M38A1. Look, Radar, our Jeep! It's a general's Jeep! No, 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 no. What they've done in order to get into the officers' club is they put a general's flag on our Jeep. There was also a CJ-6, which was a longer wheelbase version, and these were not as popular to U.S. buyers. They were available until 1975 for sale, though, 
and U.S. Forestry Services ordered some through 1981. Only about 50,000 of these were made in total in the U.S. Anyway, the styling would prove to be a very familiar sight on U.S. roads for decades to come with these new Jeeps, as CJ5s were available to buy until CDs came out in the 1980s. CJ5s had a little longer wheelbase and overall length than the CJ3B. The rounded fenders and hood made their first appearance on CJs with these. The Hurricane four-cylinder carried over on these to start, but different engines came to play later. In 1961, you could get a Perkins 192 cubic inch or 3.1 liter diesel as an option until 1965. It was rated at 62 horsepower and 143 pounds of torque. Perkins is a British engine maker that is still around today. They were acquired by Caterpillar in 1998. By the early 60s, some customers were complaining to Kaiser about the lack of power under the hood with the Hurricane 4. Kaiser's solution was to purchase the license and tooling for another car maker's engine. That would be the 225 cubic inch or 3.7 liter version of the Buick Fireball V6. This was the first V6 used in an American car starting in 1962, and both Buick and Oldsmobiles had them available in the 60s. GM didn't mind selling it later, as the muscle car era was making this V6 unpopular for them. The irony was in the 1970s, they actually bought the rights to it back, as the 73 OPEC oil crisis made smaller engines like this more viable. I discussed this a little in my Grand National episode, as the 3.8 liter Buick enjoyed a long life at GM from the 70s until the 21st century. Anyway, the 155 gross horsepower V6 under the hood of CJ5s and 6s proved to be quite popular, and about 75% of CJs sold by 1968 had one in it. Kaiser Jeep called it a dotless V6. And before I forget, I think Jeep started getting seat belts up front at least for 1967. 69 models had a 462 performance package that was a loaded up model with the V6. They also offered a rare camper accessory that could fit any CJ5 from 1955 through 1970. Only 336 of these were made, so good luck finding one on Facebook Marketplace. Kaiser Jeep was acquired by the American Motors Corporation in 1970. AMC started branding the CJ as more of a fun off-roader versus a trusty farmhand that it was largely known for before. AMC certainly noticed the popularity of the surfer image and VW-based dune buggies that were hot. Renegade trim models started in 1970 with special striping, bright colors, and large wheels and tires. A Renegade 2 was out for 71 with alloy wheels now and more brighter colors. By the 72 model year, the Buick design V6 and Hurricane 4s were gone, as AMC had their own engines for the CJ as Torque Command inline sixes were now standard on all trims. Base ones was a 232 cubic inch 3.8 liter, and optional was a 258 cubic inch 4.2 liter. MSRP started at 2955 or 22200 in 2024. You could also get a potent 304 cubic inch or 5 liter AMC V8 under the hood. The base 6 had about 100 horsepower, but the V8 offered 50% more at 150 and more torque. Jeeps were fairly light, so you could surprise your muscle car owning friend at a stoplight with one. Now to allow for the new larger engines, the wheelbase on CJ5 was lengthened about 2.5 inches, and front fenders and hood are 5 inches longer. The box frame was beefed up for more rigidity, and the fuel tank was larger and now moved from under the driver's seat to the rear where most vehicles would have had a gas tank then. The popular Renegade returns again for 72, and now it's sporting the V8 alloy wheels and limited differential standard. Renegade models were made until 1983 for the most part. Now for 73, a Jeep's Quadratrack full-time four-wheel drive system was also made available. So was such luxuries like a radio you could order now. 73 also had a very rare Super Jeep trim, and this was created to address a problem. The alloy wheels on Renegades was so popular, AMC ran out. The solution was a 258 cubic inch or V8 powered model with crazy graphics, 
two-tone vinyl seats, and things like a curved chrome front bumper, but it rode on steel wheels. He only produced about 300 of these, and once alloy wheels were available again, Renegades were back on the menu. You'd just have to admire AMC for the times they got lemons and figured out how to make lemonade with it. By 75, dealer installed air conditioning was now available, and so is AMC's popular Levi's trim option. This gave you seats that looked like jean material and small Levi's stickers on the outside. This was an option on other AMC cars then too, like the Gremlin, which I've already done a video on. Now for 76, Jeep modified the frame for better stability, and the body tub itself was more rounded and windshield frame was changed. This meant any 75 model or tops you had wouldn't fit a 76 and up. 76 also debuted a new CJ7, which was 10 inches longer than the CJ5. These would eventually replace the CJ5, and even the first generation of Wrangler years later would basically be one with a lot of updates. The CJ7 was made to address stability concerns on CJ5s, and the longer design allowed for more interior room and hinged doors. It also allowed for automatic transmissions. A base 76 CJ7 started at $4,299 or $23,820.24. For 1977, Jeep decided Pontiac shouldn't have all the fun with giant bird graphics on the hood. A new Golden Eagle trim package was now here for your CJ. This upscale uh, model, besides the color and decals, included items like a tachometer, clock, painted gold wheels, Levi's Edition interior, top, and more. If you recall the show The Dukes of Hazard, Daisy Duke drove a Golden Eagle CJ7. From what I read, you paid about 200 bucks more for it over a Renegade then, or about a grand a day. 79 had 1,000 silver anniversary models to commemorate 25 years of the CJ5. These were special editions of a Renegade trim CJ5. CJs and Jeeps sold pretty good in the 70s, but Jeep numbers were not really huge then. Most years up to 74 were in the 70 to 95,000 range annually, and that was for the entire lineup. Numbers improved though, as by 1978, 180,000 Jeeps sold in the US. Now for 1980, CJ's got more changes. The base engine was the return of a Hurricane four-cylinder. No doubt the second oil crisis of 79 prompted that decision. But this wasn't the Hurricane of old, as AMC bought and rebranded GM Iron Duke 2.5 liter fours for use in the Jeep. They had about 82 horsepower. 4.2 liter inline sixes and the 5 liter AMC V8 were still optional though. Jeep also welcomed the 1980s with a one-year-only Golden Hawk trim package. It was basically a decal kit. All CJs had a four-speed manual standard now. Car gurus list a CJ7 that isn't four-wheel drive this year and for 1981. If any Jeep people want to weigh in on that with comments, please do so. Now in December of 1980, the show 60 Minutes had a hit piece segment on the CJ5 claiming it could roll over easily at relatively low speeds. CJs, like other 4x4s at the time, were already experiencing a dip in popularity, likely due to the 79 oil crisis, and this program segment on TV didn't help matters. It was discovered years later, though, that the test may have been exaggerated or even rigged for a more dramatic effect. We see more shenanigans like this later with the Bronco 2, Suzuki Samurai, and a Suzu Trooper. But our shenanigans are cheeky and fun. Yeah, I mean, his shenanigans are cruel and tragic. Which makes them not shenanigans at all, really. Evil shenanigans. Laredo models made their debut on CJ5 and 7 for 1980. These had chromed out accent pieces, grill, bumpers, and wheels. 1981 would be the final year for the V8 CJs. MSRP for a base CJ5 then was now 7600 bucks or about 26300 today. New for 81 was the CJ8 or maybe better known as the Scrambler. These were a pickup version of the CJ7 and had a longer wheelbase. They were available with either 4 or 6 cylinder power and they were manufactured through 1986 and I want one. By 82, 
CJ5s were winding down as the last year for them would be 1983. The CJ7 was getting the spotlight though, and two special trims were offered for this year. The more common one was a new limited model. These well-appointed luxury Jeeps had the six-cylinder and either automatic or five-speed available. They had chrome, AM FM stereo, and even optional leather available. A loaded one then set you back over 12 grand in 82. That's about 39,000 now, which by coincidence is what a 2024 Wrangler starts at today. Limiteds were made for 82 and 83, and about 2,000 of them were uh, made over those two model years. The other special CJ for 82 was more rare, and it was called a Jamboree Commemorative Edition. These were made to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Jeepers Jamboree, an annual off-road event where Jeep owners get together and hit the Rubicon Trail, and it's still a thing through today. They all had a special gold paint, gold accent seats, and other trim. A 5-speed manual was with it, but a few automatics were also made. The $1,332 option required you to spec out a CJ7 to a certain level to add it. One of these was around $9,900 then, or $32,300 today, so it was cheaper than a limited. Estimates are only about 630 of these were made, so this is the first Jeep Rubicon, basically. 1983 was the CJ's Five's last, and the CJ7 and Scrambler continue on after that. The regular CJ7s get a broader range of transmission options, including an automatic and a 5-speed. For 1984, the Scrambler gets a 5-speed now available, and 4-cylinder models are now AMC 2.5 liters with 105 horsepower. 85 and 86 basically carry over, as the replacements for both were in development. The Scrambler would be replaced by the Comanche, and I discussed that in my XJ Cherokee episode. The CJ7 would pass the torch to the YJ Wrangler, and that would be for a future chatter. Jeep sales for the first half of the 1980s basically limped along as a brand, until the 84 XJ Cherokee arrived to high acclaim. Jeep sales more than doubled between 1983 and 1984, thanks largely to it alone. CJs certainly made their impact on and off-road in the U.S., and uh, in many other parts of the world, too. These long-running models spawned competitors over the years like the Land Cruiser, Bronco, Samurai, Patrol, and many others. It's nice that even today you can buy a Jeep with an appearance and purpose that's not too far off what they were originally, just loaded up with a lot more toys nowadays and certainly they are larger in size too. Anyway, this has been my Jeep CGI chatter and I hope you liked it. Leave a like if so please and certainly comment as there's got to be a lot of Jeep stories out there. Thanks to current subscribers of course, and if you're not one yet, join the club. It's free. Anyway, until next time, chatter out.